To us humans, getting struck by lightning is an amazingly rare occurrence, but other things get struck by lightning all the time. Things a little closer to the clouds where lightning forms. Things like wind turbines. To wind turbines, getting struck by lightning is less like bad luck and more like an inevitability. Standing 200 or more meters tall, wind turbines are so easy for lightning to hit that they've been captured attracting a bolt every three seconds during a storm. On average, each wind turbine blade gets struck one to 20 times each year, depending on how storm prone the location is. So how does a wind turbine take hundreds of bolts of lightning over its lifetime and stay standing? In this video, we're going to find out about the tricks engineers use to make sure getting struck by lightning is no big deal. And we're gonna find out what happens when they get it wrong. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. I'm Rosie Barnes, an engineer with a PhD and decades of experience developing wind energy technologies and other energy transition technologies. And this video is sponsored by my own company, Pardalo Consulting. One of the services I provide at Pardalo is working with wind farm owners who are having problems with defects that they need to work with manufacturers to resolve. And that includes a lot of damage from lightning strikes. When you were a kid, did you ever drag your feet as you walked down a carpeted corridor and then get a shock when you reached for a doorknob? That is effectively lightning on a tiny scale. Both are examples of friction causing a static electrical charge to build up. In the case of lightning, it's ice crystals and maybe water droplets bumping up against each other that build that charge. This charged energy can be released within a cloud, to another cloud, to the upper atmosphere, or to the ground. Although cloud to ground strikes are the least common type of strike, they're the most well understood because we're here on the ground to observe them. When a lightning bolt reaches towards the earth, it's reaching towards a big conductor. The earth conducts electricity well, and it's also enormous. So it can absorb all the charge from lightning strikes without us getting zapped every time we step on the surface. Before I needed to understand lightning for my work, the way that I thought about lightning strikes is maybe similar to how you do, that it always chooses the easiest path to ground and that's usually something tall and conductive. And I always wondered, how does lightning know what's the easiest path? Lightning isn't alive, it can't see where the most conductive objects are. So if it doesn't know where to strike, what makes it choose one path over another and why is that usually the tallest object around? In fact, the single lightning bolt pervasive in culture from cartoons to Greek mythology doesn't tell the full story. Instead, it helps to think of lightning as a tree with a trunk and many branches. Whatever branch or leader makes the connection from earth to cloud first will be the main path. All the charge in the other branches will dump into the main path and that's when it looks like the classic Harry Potter lightning bolt. That's negative lightning, which usually flows from ground to a cloud. Positive lightning from the cloud to the ground tends to be a single leader with very little branching. It doesn't really branch because positive lightning is basically hoovering electrons as it moves. We talked at the start about how lightning is static electricity shock. Getting a little shock on the doorknob hurts a tiny bit, but not so much that kids don't do it for fun. On the other hand, even if it's not something you've experienced yourself, we all know that getting struck by lightning isn't fun. So what's so dangerous about it? Lightning, or any big electric charge, causes damage essentially because it makes things heat up a lot fast. Just like electricity is our name for charged particles moving, heat is our name for particles moving quickly. The two are closely related and we'll talk about the consequences for wind turbines in a minute. Wind turbines from bottom to top are made up of a foundation supporting a tower, which supports a nacelle with a generator inside and power cables run through all that. Attached to the nacelle is a hub with rotor blades. Until recently, wind turbine blades were nearly entirely made of fiberglass and balsa wood or foam, all of which are pretty good electrical insulators, meaning they don't conduct electricity well. So based on what we said about how lightning chooses a path to earth, you might think that non-conductive fiberglass wind turbine blades would be safe from lightning strikes. You'd be wrong, but at least you'd be in good company with others who made that same mistake. In the 1990s, hundreds of wind turbines were installed without lightning protection in Texas and Japan by a certain manufacturer whose engineers believed that since the blades aren't conductive, they wouldn't be struck by lightning. Anecdotally, I've heard that they specifically didn't want to add a lightning protection system as they thought that would attract lightning. This mistake was partly due to a lack of knowledge about how lightning works and partly a false sense of security from the fact that they didn't have problems with the first turbines they installed in parts of California where lightning activity is low. Because those blades weren't struck, they assumed that blades couldn't get struck. We already talked about the fact that wind turbine blades can and do get struck by lightning. And furthermore, it turns out that it gets struck far more often than chance alone would dictate. This is not just because blades reach a couple of hundred meters up into the sky, but it turns out that the blade spinning underneath a cloud has actually been documented causing strikes due to its local electric field. So what happened to those early wind turbines that were installed under the assumption they would never get struck by lightning? Well, 
It wasn't good. When lightning strikes an unprotected wind turbine blade, it causes the blade to heat up immensely. In the worst case, you can end up with a blade on fire, kind of like a Catherine wheel firework on a very grand scale. It's rare that it gets that bad though. A more common occurrence is that the rapid heat from a lightning strike causes punctures, charring, fiber breakage, and delamination, which is when the layers of the fiberglass come apart in sheets or shards and buckling. These might not result in spectacular fire wheels, but blades with that kind of damage are not safe to continue operating. The structural damage from the strike will cause the blade to fail sooner or later. So repair crews are sent up to dangle off ropes and repair the damage. But we now know that turbines might get struck hundreds of times in their lifetime. So in a big wind farm with hundreds of wind turbines, we must be expecting blades to fall out of the sky every time there's a thunderstorm in the region. And I can tell you now that wind farms do not employ a rope access repair crew to go up and repair all the site's blades after every storm. Well then, surely the first wind farm was struck down by its first thunderstorm and now the very idea of wind turbines has been shown to be unworkable, a futile machine to be destroyed within a week of powering up. Well, that hasn't happened. And the reason why is engineering. We've covered what happens when lightning strikes an unprotected wind turbine, but after a couple of early damages due to lightning strike, wind turbine designers figured out pretty quickly that lightning protection systems are needed. A wind turbine lightning protection system, or LPS, is similar to the way we protect buildings from lightning strikes, with a Franklin rod or lightning attractor. A lightning attractor is essentially a metal rod sharpened to a point and then connected to a conductive cable down to earth. This lightning attractive device is connected to a structure that you don't want to be struck by lightning. The idea is that by giving it a really attractive place to strike, lightning will strike that and not the structure itself. A wind turbine's lightning protection system is very similar with a conductive receptor or receptors attached to a thick copper or aluminium cable that runs through the blade and then through the tower down into the ground or ocean for offshore wind turbines. The way it works is that lightning attaches at the receptor at the tip of the blade, and then the energy flows through the conductive cable and into the earth, missing the important parts of the wind turbine entirely and without heating up any of the blade enough to damage it or catch fire. So that works very well in theory, and it worked pretty well in practice too for decades. Until recently, wind turbine damage due to lightning strike was fairly rare and probably due to damage or being poorly maintained or an abnormally large strike, or in very infrequent occurrences when lightning attached onto a part of the blade that the protection system wasn't designed to handle. When lightning protection systems fail, the current no longer flows through the path that the blade designers wanted it to. Instead, some of the energy hits a different part of the blade or it can spark across from one part to another. That internal sparking is called flashover and it causes a similar type of damage to when lightning attaches to a place it's not supposed to. In extreme cases, lightning can be the main cause of downtime on a wind farm. Lightning damage remains the most common insurance claim from wind farm operators, accounting for up to 80% of the complaints filed with insurance companies. Lightning protection systems intend to keep wind turbines functioning, but a bolt or a hundred eroding their functionality down the track is still treated as part of the course. In recent years, however, lightning damage has been happening more often and more severely. Why is that? To be honest, I don't think that anyone really knows for sure. I kind of laughed at those early wind turbine engineers who misunderstood lightning and decided that their turbines didn't need protection, but the industry is kind of going through a similar struggle now. Lightning protection systems that have been carefully designed and tested according to international standards are still experiencing failures in the field. The reasons for this are probably due to several factors. Turbines are getting taller and blades are getting longer. We're using carbon fiber in blades to make them stiffer and carbon fiber is a great electrical conductor. And lightning testing is not a very good approximation of real lightning strikes. We'll go through each of these now, starting with testing. We can't recreate a lightning strike in a lab that matches exactly what a cloud does. Pretty much every lightning engineer working on wind turbines will tell you that it is much easier to design a system that will pass lab tests and certification than it is to design a system that will reliably protect turbines from lightning damage in the field. When testing in the lab, test engineers will simulate individual aspects of a lightning strike. On the largest scale, they take a real blade, cut off the last 20-ish meters or whatever will fit in the test facility. And to that blade piece, they'll do a high current test to ensure the current travels from the tip receptor all the way down the copper cable instead of sparking off into other parts of the blade. And then separately, they perform a high voltage test to see where lightning attaches to a blade. A real lightning strike obviously has high current and high voltage at the same time, but the amount of power needed for that is way beyond what is feasible in the lab. Up to 200,000 volts and 200 kiloamps is applied during testing, which is lower than the 300 million volts and 30,000 amps delivered in real lightning strike. But that's not even the main problem. The main issue causing blade damage during a lightning strike is its specific energy, how fast the lightning's energy is delivered. Delivering the same amount of energy quickly is much more damaging than if it's slower. And here again, the lab just can't match reality. 
And there are other compromises made based on what's achievable inside a lab. First, lab tests are on shiny and new blades with shiny new lightning protection systems. They can't predict how the LPS will fare halfway into its lifespan, where dust has accumulated on surfaces and strain from aerodynamic loads has caused tiny cracks in the blade resin, and after having already endured 50 of its couple of hundred lightning strikes. Second, it's just the last part of the blade that's tested, and so the charger charges much more predictably in the lab than in the field. The blade sits stationary on a test rig rather than rotating like it does outside. And it turns out that matters because recently we're starting to learn that the way the air moves around the turning blade has a lot to do with how and where lightning attaches. All of these things can affect where lightning attaches and how likely it is to flash over from where the current is supposed to go to somewhere it shouldn't. I spoke to Alan Hall from WeatherGuard Lightning Tech about this, and by the way, they sponsor the Engineering with Rosie live streams, but not this video. I asked Alan why he thinks that there's such a gap between testing required for certification and reality. He told me that we need to stop thinking about lightning as electrical wiring and start thinking about it as a compressible fluid. A lightning channel can actually be moved around by the wind. What happens for the one to two seconds a lightning channel has to follow a blade around its path of rotation? Does the lightning stay attached to the receptor or does the airflow and turbulence push it off the receptor? If we think about lightning as an electrical wiring problem, as in that it follows the path of least electrical resistance, then the answer is lightning always stays attached to the receptor. But if we think about lightning from an aerodynamic, thermodynamic perspective, then it's a column of really hot air, then lightning can be pushed wherever the wind wants it to go. So that is how lightning testing works and what its limitations are. The next potential cause for lightning protection system failures is changes to the blades themselves. I'm sure we've all noticed that wind turbines are getting really big recently. This means blades are getting long and reaching further into the sky. That in itself is a likely cause of more lightning strike, but there are additional consequences of long blades. Long blades need to be stiffer to withstand the larger aerodynamic forces on them. Increasingly, wind turbine blades have been manufactured with some carbon fiber, which is stiffer than fiberglass. Unlike fiberglass, carbon fiber is electrically conductive. That means it's more likely to be hit, but also that when lightning is in the blade, there is a second attractive path for that current to flow, meaning the risk of flashover between the lightning cable and carbon fiber elements is high. And though carbon fiber can conduct electricity pretty well, the thickness of carbon fiber in a wind turbine blade is nowhere near enough to be able to take the current of a lightning strike without heating up excessively. Lightning protection systems have changed to account for the new blade designs, with multi-receptor systems to account for the likelihood that lightning will attach at places along the blade as well as at the tip. And sometimes a protective conductive layer such as a copper mesh is added to take current that would otherwise have gone into the carbon fiber. These new systems are definitely protecting huge carbon fiber blades better than the older designs would have, but there simply isn't enough operational experience and years of iterative design changes to end up at a reliable design yet. I talked about the challenges with getting lab testing to accurately reflect the realities of real world lightning strike. Lightning engineers will also run very detailed simulations to try out new designs before they sign off on a design to manufacture and test in the lab. But testing and simulations are mainly good at assessing incremental changes, not completely new designs. We've talked about how lightning striking wind turbines is not as infrequent as you might think. However, it's still far from a daily occurrence and it's not something you can schedule. When new wind turbines are designed, the manufacturer will make a test turbine or two to install in the field and monitor over a year or two. And those test turbines will, of course, have the lightning protection system in place. But one or two turbines over a year or two is not enough to ensure that the LPS will see any action at all in the test period. Once the test period is up, hundreds or thousands of turbines are manufactured and installed all around the world. If there's a problem with the LPS, it will take years before it's clear whether the first failures are due to freakishly big lightning strikes that they were never designed to withstand, or if the LPS design is faulty. And by that time, there are probably thousands of turbines out there, and so any problem can end up incredibly expensive to fix across the whole fleet. To wind farm operators, occasional and usually repairable lightning damage is commonplace, inevitable but it can be costly. A German electric power company, for example, shut down and dismantled their Helgoland Island wind power plant after suffering more than $540,000 in lightning related losses over years of operations. And there are plenty of other examples. I need to give a big thank you to electrical engineer and lightning expert, Alan Hall from WeatherGuard Lightning Tech for his help with this video. If you've got any questions related to lightning, then write them in the comments and Alan and I will address them in a live stream coming up in about a week or two. I've put a link in the description. And as always, thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team who support this and every video on the channel. We've got a Patreon-only Discord server where we chat about all things related to the energy transition. If you'd like to join us, you can do so at this link, which I've put in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.